Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us today. If you are a first-time listener, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the, the program. Uh, we ask you to do a couple things as a new listener. Don't forget to subscribe so that way you get all of the latest updates. Then also, too, uh, we want those be- uh, ratings. And I'm not afraid to beg. In fact, I've got a collar on today, so I'm a well-dressed beggar. So if you think we're doing a good job, give us those five stars. It helps us with placement in the app stores for for podcasts so thank you very much uh we also want to throw this out real quick and housekeeping things please stop by the rexandrewshow.com website and the reason we ask you to do that a couple things number one when we interview these folks that we have on the show all of our guests we only get to scratch the tip of the iceberg many times because we have high-powered individuals doing interesting things and so you can get a bio out on the website for our guests today and then any guests then we have about 60 guests uh, that are lined up to interview so if you want to tune in and find out more information about upcoming so please stop by that and then of course we want to thank uh, particular audiences that show up uh, and be in the uh, uh, program so today i want to recognize the folks in iowa city iowa who have tuned in so welcome and i hope you're uh, having a great day out there in iowa city um, we're very thankful uh, because of the listeners. We are listened to in 32 countries, a little over 500 cities, and that is across six continents. And if I could figure out how to market to penguins, we'd probably have some listeners in Antarctica, but the bigger challenge is how would they uh, charge their cell phones? So um, with no further ado, I'm excited to get people to meet our guest today. It is uh, another fun guest. You know, my biggest problem in life is I've got too many interests for just one lifetime, but worse than that is there's always another discovery around every corner, and we've got one today. So let me get into this, and we will get this rocking and rolling. Uh, My guest is really exciting. Uh, She's got her hands in a lot of pies. If you want to keep up with her, you're going to need to have your battery charge and your tennis shoes on. Uh, She's a speaker, and not only is she a speaker, she's a TEDx speaker. We'll talk about that. She has a podcast out there, and so it's always great to have a peer on the show, and we'll talk about those things. She's an author, written some books, and we'll uh, walk you through that. Now, this one's interesting. She's a comedian and has stuff out on uh, iTunes that is uh, her her comedian stuff, so does a lot of prank calls, apparently, so I think we can talk about that. Um, She's a speaker trainer because she's been speaking for more than 20 years. She's now teaching others the craft of speaking. Uh, She likes to describe herself as a creative buddy. And then I like this one because there's a lot of these out there. She's a professional nag. Now, apparently that is a term of endearment and that is not a uh, moniker of uh, uh, disrespect. So I'd like to welcome in today from the great state of Minnesota, Lisa David Olson. Lisa, how are you this morning? Good morning, Rex. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Well, it's good to have you on the show. Now, um, as people know, it's a biography show. We tell the stories. We want to go back in time to look at the influences in your life uh, so we can show people how you've got to where you are. You know, um, success does not fall out of the sky. And now, however, a little earlier this year, I had airplane parts fall out of the sky and land three blocks from my house when United Nuh-uh. Airlines. Yep, United Airlines blew an engine on a plane and the parts, <gasps> the parts rained down and some of them landed within three blocks of my house. So... Uh, That's unreal. Did they come to get the pieces or did oh, you save oh, yeah. them? The park, uh, I live about three blocks in another direction to a park and the park was littered with airplane parts and they shut down the whole area. They were going house by house, make, looking for stuff. Oh, uh, there was gosh. one piece uh, that was uh, the outer ring of the engine, you know, the outer um, uh, aluminum ring that you see on the front of the engine. Right. It, it landed in one piece uh, on a house um, just a few blocks from here. So And no uh, injuries, it sounds like. N- no injuries, but uh, in the scary part is they were able to get the plane turned back around. They got it on the ground. There's <gasps> there's video on the internet of the the engine just on fire and they're they're flying back to DIA. Well, the crazy part is when they inspected the plane, there was a hole in the wing, you know, the, and the fuel tanks are mm. in the wings. Mm-hmm. It was less than a foot and a half, the damage to the, to the uh, fuel tank. If that would have gone, it, we would have had lots of parts in my, the yard, probably incredible. So anyway, the unreal whole... that nobody was at the park. That's yeah. such a great, great ending to a tragic, 
tragic incident. story. Well, I didn't mean to take us down that rat hole, but <laughs> su- uh, success doesn't fall out of the sky, and that's the point I try to. Yeah. Make. Well, there you, you go. Know, yeah. But but airplane parts can. So. But um, some stuff can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Stuff can. So anyway. <laughs> What we're going to do, and I have a series of questions, and don't worry about having to write these down because I'll fire them at you after interviewing hundreds of people. Um, it's uh, easy to remember my line of questioning. We want to go back to the beginning and understand where you were born, okay? Yeah. And then where you were raised. I had a guest, as we were talking about um, on the preview, is uh, I had a guest on the show, Ellie Soja, who moved 63 times before the age of 15. And so... Uh, quite a set of drama and tra- trauma with her growing up uh, there. We want to know about your family life a little bit, because that can also uh, impact things. If you have siblings, and then if you have siblings that survived your harassment, uh, we also want to know about your parents, okay? Mm-hmm. Parental influence is huge. And in all the interviews that I've done, I kind of come to the conclusion there's three main buckets. Now, there are variations of all of these, but, and I'm not a therapist. But the first bucket is a super supportive bucket. So these are the parents that were fully engaged, uh, you know, pushing you along, helping you get to the, your dreams and, and out the door and those stuff. Then the middle bucket, sort of the non-participatory um, parents, where uh, they loved their kids and they were supportive, but they weren't fully engaged because they were so busy eking out a living that they weren't as supportive as, you know, kids would want. And then the last bucket I call the struggle bucket. And Struggle bucket's not a great bucket. It's often uh, created with addiction, uh, abuse, um, extreme poverty, you know, rough situations and things like that. And the main motivator of that last bucket is it uh, motivates kids to be completely different. You know, kids say, hey, I don't want any part of that. And so that struggle bucket, you know, those stories are amazing. And not only can they influence us on a good way, but they also can create um, hurdles for people to overcome. So we want to know about your parents, family life, that stuff. Uh, and also, what were you doing as a kid outside of school? You know, what were your interests? You know, sports, theater, dance, computers, shoplifting. Don't laugh. I had a guest on the show, Larry Cole, who by the age of 15 was a car thief. So he had a progression of things that he was doing and ended up being a car thief. So um, that was an interesting influence in his life. And so then we want to hopscotch around your career a little bit here and there. Talk about some pivot points, you know, what motivated you to write your books, uh, get into speaking, you know, yada, 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 those types of things. And so, yada, yada. That's right. Et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. You know, everybody's got their stories. But what we really want to do is kind of end up where you are today, you know, and understanding uh, the success that you're enjoying and what you're up to and how you're impacting the world. So, if you could, Lisa, could you go back to the beginning and Mm -hmm. tell us, tell us where were you born? Absolutely. I was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I live right across the Mississippi from that area right now, which is a 10-minute drive. Just okay. the most beautiful area, bluffs, all the greenery, the ridges. It's just a beautiful, beautiful area. And I am 55, so a child of the 60s into the 70s, although I was too young to enjoy all that they had <laughs> back then. So then we... I think I was about six years old and our family moved to Clarksville, Tennessee, because my father worked for a, a big company, train company, T-R-A-N-E, which is centrifugal yeah. chillers, HVAC yep. systems. So we moved to Tennessee for only six years and then back to this area. So that part alone really messed with my education. Okay. Um, I'm number three of four children and that messed with us so bad with education if you are familiar with Midwest teachers, they are at a premium. Everyone wants a teacher from the Midwest. My sure. brother and his wife both teach in California because they're from the Wisconsin area. It's like, come on over. We need more Midwest teachers. So high praise to the education system in the area in which I grew up. But age six to 12 really screwed me up for setting way back in education. And I spent my life trying to catch that up and so what, did what not was- have... What was the big difference down in Tennessee? Way behind as far as, okay, one of the big things we worked on in Tennessee that I recall, because I have very bad memory because of growing up in a traumatic childhood. Again, there's nothing you can't ask me. Sure. And we worked so long and so feverishly on the metric system that we, and there was ice storms, I recall. So we were going to school on Saturdays to catch up. And 
I remember, and I, I feel like this is PTSD in a sense, and I'm, I'm making light of that, no offense, that we worked with lentils for the metric system and two liter bottles. And we worked feverishly knowing that the country was going to flip to the metric system. That oh was, goodness. that's huge in my mind. And yeah, we were very fast simple. forward to today, you got two liter bottles of soda and you've got 5k races and that's pretty much all we really did. Yep. <laughs> so my early education was really, really sideways. It was really a path when I needed that highway. <laughs> so then I no. come back to, you know, to the Midwest and I had missed out on, you know, things like geography and math and learning to read music. Although I did become a drummer in a band, but that's, I still didn't learn to read music. I became a singer. <laughs> Everything's by ear. So that was my childhood was a lot about, you know, just that one bounce, not like your guest who moved 63 times. No, it does make an impact. And those things impact us for life. And uh, I am very similar age as you. And I do remember that big push to the metric system, <laughs> which never happened. Yeah. You know, doing all the, okay, a kilometer is 0. 0.6 of a mile. Um, a meter is three inches longer than a yard. I mean, yeah. you know, all that. Centimeter and like, okay, I'll have a two liter of the cola and I'll, I'll watch my friend run the 5k and I'm going to have yeah. a donut. That's right. You go, you, you go. go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. So how was the, now what's the span of age between your four um, kids, the four kids in your family? Are you yeah. close together in age, spread apart? What's that look like? Yeah, pretty close. Two years apart until my younger brother is four years after me. Okay. All righty. And then uh, your dad worked for train. Uh, did he stay in that corporate environment as you were growing up? He did. I okay. remember the, he is a computer programmer and, and at, at his age in the mid eighties of his age right now, he is still into computers and doing eBay and all this. So I'm so impressed with that. Um, and back then your computer was a uh, half of the floor yeah. of the building. And I remember that to use, um, to call out on a long distance call, there was the Watts line. And I, yeah. I seem to recall, we were allowed to go make a long distance call once in a while. And it was yeah. like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, my, I've been in computers for 34 years and I can, and not even counting the high school and stuff. I can remember in college doing punch card um, projects with yep. punch cards. Yeah. Yep. So yep. yeah, it's good. Yeah. The kids today don't realize they're walking around with, you know, a computer in their pocket that is, you know, tons and tons magnitudes more power and storage than the mainframes you know not that well there's ago. there's the joke online that says um you know we thought as kids that it would be a great thing one day to actually have a, a computer we could carry around yeah. and now flash forward to you've got a hand computer and what are you doing you're sharing cat memes yeah no <laughs> kidding no I remember kidding. I would get upset when somebody put away our encyclopedias in the wrong alphabetical order what yeah. yep exactly what? <laughs> or, or what a big deal it was for a family to buy a set of en encyclopedias, you know, mm -hmm. your, your own set and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I can remember that. <laughs> when we cleaned out my parents' house, when my father passed away, I mean, all that went in recycle. You know, oh, you know, how many ginormous dictionaries did oh, you get rid of? Yeah, oh, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> so were you a good student? No, okay. <laughs> no. All that setback. And growing up in a traumatic home, my mother was a functioning alcoholic okay. and my father was really just, he was there, but I don't know, kind of like Tim, the tool man's neighbor. You just didn't see him. Okay. I very much thought I was a daddy's girl until I wrote my book and things um, were dug up in my own brain of this pattern of, I, I just picture my dad taking me on walks and we would just do th light things. And then you realize Somebody, um, when I was interviewed by one of the newscasters, they were like, so where was your dad? And here my book is out and I'm about to do a book release. And I, and it just, it hit me like a, a heat wall. And I said, well, he was there. And she goes, oh, why, why didn't he help you guys? And it was just like, I did everything I could to try and put a face on, but that was huge to me. And it's, it's interesting the things we can bury as youngsters or just survival mode. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. definitely a fight or flight. I have high anxiety. Well, I'm diagnosed with mild anxiety. So I dabble in it, but this is why I stay busy. And growing up in the traumatic home of my mom 
being this very much into humor and entertainment, she was the star. If she worked, she always worked. And when she would work, she'd always end up managing a place, managing a restaurant, managing a a bar and she was the star, you know, almost picture Judy Garland walking in the room. And, and then at home it was dark. It was, she was drunk when it was dark and we'd get pulled out of bed and told clean the bathroom. Who did this, whatever this was. And the three of us would take turns just getting beat with the belt so we could go back to bed. And I, I say that lightly. It certainly wasn't light. And my, my younger brother was very much, um, not a part of that. Um, mm-hmm. The baby. Yeah. So um, we each handled it in a different way as we got older. I'm, I'm happy to go into that as, as you ask if you want. And it, it was such a roller coaster. So if you got McDonald's the next day or a, a pizza, because back then takeout food wasn't that. No, that was a rarity. Yeah. Then you knew you, you if, if you saw us having McDonald's, we were probably beaten pretty bad the night before. Mm-hmm. And dad ignored it, honestly. And I, I still love my dad. And when my book came out, I wouldn't give anyone a book until I gave it to him because I left school at 17. I, I quit because between being extremely ill from all the things that were happening and um, not having supportive parents that said, how'd that exam go today? Right, <laughs> I laughed right. because that was not a conversation in my home. Right. And all of that, and I, I am not saying excuses, I made choices. And I couldn't cut it in school and I quit and I left. And you know what my parents did? Mm. Uh, Nothing. Nothing. So that's weird to me. And there are times I think, what if I had parents that really wanted to make sure I did well in school? And what if I had parents that really said, no, 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 this is what we do. And no, I left home at 17 and I got an apartment and I worked. I didn't have a car. I took a bus to work and and things like that. So I have tenacity. I am a survivor that way. I'm a strong person, but each of us handle it in our own way yep. in the family. Yeah, I, I can relate to the abuse. I, my father was had a really short temper. I'm pretty sure he was bipolar and had uh, issues, but uh, yep, I've been chased around a yard with a belt and uh, kicked at and hit and all kinds of things. So I understand that, you know, that environment. So when you come from a struggle bucket, um, not only does it make you a survivor and someone works hard, but you have some damage. You know, you do have some emotional yeah. damage. And that's what you had said about the different levels in those buckets. And my mother was between the super supportive and the struggle. And then dad was the middle. Yeah. And mom is the one that got me interested in this, uh, a singing group. And then she was the, the first one to be at one of my shows. But then as I got older, I learned boundaries and it, it was extreme. Um, there was one point where she almost died and I, and I was able to connect an uh, ambulance and that's in my book as well, or we can talk about it, but this high and low, it was almost like one of those abusive marriages where yeah. she stays because she doesn't know any better, but I have such boundaries now. I'm not even in touch with all my siblings. Oh, wow. No, that, that's hard. And it sounds like she was kind of the yo-yo in your life, you know, love and yes. then abuse, you know, just back and right. forth. And, and for kids, they don't know how to process that. Now, as an adult, you could take a step back and look at that and go, wow, I can see that pattern. But kids, kids don't understand that. And like you said, I'm certain my mother also was self-medicating for her mental issues. But mm-hmm. as a kid, you don't know that. It would have been no. really cool. But when you and I grew up, a neighbor would not step in. A teacher would not step nope. in. Nope. I'm sure teachers noticed it. Now, I want to take a second to applaud all the modern day teachers that went through the shutdown and all because close friends of mine that are teachers would be, they were horrified because they could see the kids on Zoom or they didn't show up and there were certain kids they're watching. Are they clean today? Did they eat today? Without in-person school, many kids suffer because today teachers are more than just a classroom presence. They are almost the, you know, the social worker by proxy. Yeah, they are. Really, they really are. But when you and I grew up, people are like, "Oh, that's that's over there. We don't look over the fence." Yeah, don't look over there. Pay, no, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. For so, sure, for sure. No, and and things are different today than back then. I mean, if a if a parent took a belt to a kid now, you'd be in jail, right? Oh. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd you'd be strung up and you'd be on you'd be on the evening news and all kinds of stuff, but. Back then, that was just kind of what, what parents did. And, you know, you deserved it kind of thing. You know, it was, 
that was the the thinking. Oh, a little bit of roughness isn't going to hurt a kid or, you know, give them a swat on the butt and they'll remember not to do that again next time. And no, it was completely different. And I, you know, and it wasn't spotty. It was across all my friends would have the same type of behavior from their parents. You know, you knew if you did something wrong, you were going to meet some justice at home and it wouldn't be just a, a mouthful. It would be, there could be some swatting and things like that that went on, but that was just the way it was back then. In sixth grade for myself, I was still in Tennessee and teachers could paddle. <sighs> Believe me, Rex, they did not paddle me. Mm-mm. But my friend Tyrone, I remember him having to go out in the hall and I remember the teacher saying, grab your ankles, Tyrone, and you could hear whack this this wooden paddle across his rear. Can you imagine that right now? And I'm only no. 55. No, right there with you. I Believe it or not, I don't know if anybody would, would uh, think this. I'm a little bit of a smart mouth. And uh, that's, what? that started in probably kindergarten. And uh, I were many, many trips down to the principal's office. <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> that, that, that behavior even continued on to college. I think I might be the only person I've ever met that uh, got kicked out of a college class. But uh, I, I got paddled a couple times by the principal. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So any of your younger listeners are just going to be appalled by that. I oh, no. think that was still happening. Oh, the snowflakes of today would just be over the top. I mean, there were no safe spaces anywhere in my schooling anytime. Oh. But to, to think that uh, you were run down to the principal's office and got some swats out of that, that was uh, a different world. Mm. And world. when you talk about neighbors being the same and everybody had it, in my world, it wasn't. I didn't oh, know really any okay. friends who dealt with that. In fact, one of my best friends... If her parent, um, when we talked, just, you know, girl talk, trusting circle kind of thing, she never saw her parents fight. Mm. And we talked about it. I remember being like eighth grade and I said, well, what happens when they fight? Whatever she goes, they don't fight. And I just, that was a shock to me. I, I just thought that's what everybody did. And I got to stay overnight. I never had friends over cause I never knew what the night was going to bring. Um, and so, you know, I would pretend, and this is in my TEDx. I pretended I was raised by Carol Burnett because she grew up in an alcoholic home and her grandma raised her. So I would pretend Carol Burnett was my mom because she understood and she would protect me and her humor definitely shaped my life. And I'm still looking for an eight minute phone call with her. If anybody's got her phone number, <laughs> hook me up. I say eight minutes, I'll really take 15. Right. But I just would love to thank her. And I did, I did get to breathe the same air as her once. I drove three hours to see her live show a few years back when it was in Minneapolis. Yeah. And it was, she's just, oh man. She walked out on stage and I started crying and I didn't wow. expect that. It was just like, oh my God, we're in the same room. <laughs> but um, I, I used that as my device. And later I end up owning and running my own comedy troupe that was sketch comedy. I still do improvisation shows and speaking. And I didn't know as a kid that, oh, one day I will get to do that. And then I will make people laugh. And laughter is my acceptance and, and applause means approval. That's where I'm at. That's what I found. That, that was my craving. And so my comedy family became my trust circle because in improv, you have trust and you right. make each other look good. And you are together getting this conclusion out of a sketch. You want to have this great, you're, you're going for the same path of, you know, you, you have a conflict in a scene and then you have the outcome and you go for the laugh and together that happens. And that to me is trust and having each other's backs. No, I agree with you. You know, my perspective in my experience was probably a little jaded because all my friends were a bunch of smart Alex too. So uh, I f there were five of us that hung around and four of us would have consequences when we came home. The other one didn't, but uh, no, it, but it, it was a different time. It surely was a different time. And now, your need for the recognition, was that just sort of a way to handle some of the abuse that you got from your mom? Humor was a beautiful healer, and it was what we used as siblings maybe to cheer each other up. Right. We would make fun of, you know, we would do parodies of, our, of one of our parents' friends. His name, we called him Swearing Daryl. <laughs> and, and so, you know, privately as kids saying naughty words and acting, you know, using a different voice, that was just right. like the sassy thing. We'd make each other laugh. And that was healing. Humor is healing. 
And humor does raise your endorphins while it lowers your blood pressure. It releases nature's antidepressant serotonin. Also, if you could get mom laughing, and I'm not saying in the heat of a, an episode, but there were those beautiful moments that if something funny happened, if mother was laughing, she wasn't hitting us. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's Kids true. figure that stuff out right away. Really quick, really quick. So, so I craved humor and I still use humor and I raised my children with humor. Fantastic. So um, when you weren't uh, in school, uh, learning the metric system. <laughs> <laughs> Lentils. Um, what were your interests outside of school? What did you um, spend some of your spare time with? I was in track, which okay. means I put on track clothes and went with my best friend and that meant i could be away from the house for two hours yep. and we would buy cigarettes and go in the woods and drink warm blatt's beer and smoke a pack of marbs and then go back home and that was my track career <laughs> um <laughs> riding my bike until until the street lights came on okay. and um playing so much imagination right i put on shows and I would have a, a room full of an audience and I had shows where it was singing. There was, um, there was some comedy scenes, but a lot of singing, a lot of costume changes. And the audience definitely asked for more. A lot of times I'd have to say, sorry, that's it for today. And by the way, the audience was my Barbies. Okay. So I had and continue to have a huge imagination and I am grateful that we didn't have computers and, and uh, cell phones where your neck is just hanging down the whole time because my imagination created my future life of being able to do improvisation, creating a scene with just a couple of ideas and grabbing whatever prop is just inches from my hand. That's huge. I don't have to sit on TikTok to fill my head with ideas. Right. So it sounds like a little bit that... Uh... Your, a lot of your interests uh, were just to stay away from the home environment. Absolutely. I, I have worked since I was 14, cleaning hotels, um, walking pets, doing whatever, babysitting, anything I could to just go yeah. and, and be out. And that's when I realized at 17, I don't have to live here. It's funny when you hear today, like, yeah, it's a really bad home life and everything's bad. And well, my gosh, what, why how old are you? Well, I'm 24 and it really sucks. How about you leave? How about yeah. that? How about, how about you just go? <laughs> well, it's funny. Uh, I left home at 17. Uh, I went off to college, but I never went back. Yeah. And so, you know, that was just the w way it was. And I had no reason to go back to that. And it wasn't right. My father was mostly abusive when I was fairly young because I got to be fairly good size, you know, and and physically could have taken him on very easily. But um, no, getting away was an important aspect. And yeah. I think that people need to do that. I, I have a rule with my kids, uh, you know, they're 18 to uh, 26. And I insist if they're going away from school, that you go at least 100 miles. That's uh, great. Because that way you're not home every weekend or not there right. doing laundry or yeah. come, come over for a meal and stuff. Not, it's not that I don't want to see you, but you need to go grow up, right? You know, you need yeah. to get out of here. So anyway. Well, my husband, my third and final husband, and I share five. Yeah, he just yelled from the hall. Um, we share five sons. And our rule is if you're not in school and you want to live with us, you still pay utilities. Yeah. And if you're or if you are in school, you still pay utilities. But if you're not in school and you need to stay here, you're paying full out rent. Yeah. Nobody's living with us right now. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? But it's, it's a way to say, yeah, figure this out. Pay your car insurance. Oh, you know, m when my kid was like, oh, my friend's parents gave him cars. I'm like, Isn't that neat? Yeah. Now go earn a car and go pay That's your right. car insurance. Because, yeah, that you're not going to take care of it the same if it's given to you. And good, good on you guys if you could get a car. That's awesome. That's right. Where was your mom during this with your dad being the, the angry parent? My mom, um, my, my father was a Colorado State Patrolman. And of Ooh, course, okay. they, di they didn't pay very well back then. And they still don't, in my opinion, you know, for the, the there. So my dad was on these really odd hours all the time, different shifts and then if there was a fatal accident, we may not see him for 18 hours. Type of right. thing. So it was just crazy. And then just to make ends meet, my mother worked at a bank and then an insurance company. 
And my mother was very nurturing in those types of things. And she would console us after, you know, if there was some physical violence, but she didn't step in between. And so, and I, and I don't, you know, when my father passed away seven years ago, I reconciled actually probably be 10, 10 years prior to that. But when he was, you know, departing, I really made sure that I poured my heart out to him and I forgave him because he came from a very similar background. I mean, it was a generation. So no, my mom, my mom didn't have any other issues. She just didn't know how to handle it. I think sometimes and still nurturing, still loving, still give you the shirt off her back, but she just didn't step in. And you say that's the way dad came from, but yet I'm going to guess, I'm going to put a nickel down on the fact that you didn't keep that cycle going with your oh, kids. Oh, no, no. That, See, that, so isn't that interesting? Yeah. Nor did I, of course. Well, it, I think things are a little different today. I think uh, back then, especially for men, men didn't talk about things like that. You know, True. if, you, if you'd True. been abused, you didn't talk about it. And in fact, I've only publicly talked about some of the things I went through probably over the last five, six years. That's about it. Because it was just, you know, it, it was embarrassing or it just wasn't appropriate. And you just didn't want to bring those things out. But, you know, my father, I mean, my grandmother passed away when my father was 17. There were six kids. The siblings pretty much raised themselves because my grandfather, to cope, uh, turned to alcohol. So he was an alcoholic, uh, plumber's aide and laid brick and those types of things. And so... My dad and his siblings worked to basically support and bring their family up. And so, wow, that's tough. He didn't, he didn't know any better and those stuff. And so I'm pretty sure he didn't share stories of abuse, but I'm absolutely convinced there was because, you know, you know how it is. You don't hang out with an alcoholic and everything's, you know, all chipper and happy. So, but also our parents didn't share their stories. And that's the same thing that happened when my, when I handed my, my first book to my dad, I was so proud of myself. And when he got a, an idea of what I shared, I share a lot of happiness. I share a lot of pranks. I'm huge sure. into pranks and I share my project in bravery and I share all these things, but I do share the rough stories as well. And he said, why would you put that out there? That's in the past. And he did the swoop with his hand and he goes, that's in the past. And my heart sank. And I'm like, I said to him, no, it's not. That's who I am. That's yeah. what I came from. Right. And my, my kids know my whole background before I published a book. So, you know, I, I tell them, this is where I came from. This is in you yeah. and alcoholism's on both sides of your family. Be aware of that. I, that's since they were, gosh, before they were teenagers, they knew that. Sure. No, I, it's just a different way things have progressed. And I think people have been able to reconcile and face those things because, you know, I think it's this, this way, you know, human beings have been the same for all time. You know, there's, there's been always been alcoholics. There's always been people with mental health problems. There's always been people who are gay or lesbian or those types of, there's always been those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just statistically part of life. You know, there's Mm -hmm. statistically a part of life where there's a number of geniuses and things like that. That's just the human condition. What's different now. Do you remember that, uh, was it Sarah Bobbitt, the Bobbitt story where the lady cut off her husband's penis, you know, Lorena, Lorena, I'm sorry, Lorena Bobbitt. I'm sure that wasn't the first time in history that ever happened. It was, she the was first... charged with a Mr. Wiener. Yeah. Um, the thing of it is, is I'm sure that's happened many times throughout history, but it was just never publicized. Right. The, right. The, pre- the press would have never covered that. The difference between a generation or two back then, we don't talk about those things, but you, you, you can't tell me that's the first time that's ever happened in life. And so the thing that's different today is those things are on the surface. People talk about them. It's, it's available. It's out there. But I also think it's healthy because a lot of people, if you do suppress those feelings and those types of stuff, you know, you, you're going to have a lot of problems for a long time. And so, but our parents think, why would you bring that up? It's nobody's concern. That was our family. And and again, you didn't, you didn't look over the fence. So that's right. it is a big change. But like you said, in the last few years, you've shared that your background and you realize the same as myself, putting it out there in a book, stating that I dropped out of school. I mean, I certainly continued education, but I did drop out of high school. And to state that out there, and it's funny because not that many people give a darn because guess what? We all have our own story. That's true. So you That's hold true. that thinking, this is my big secret, no. you know, and it people don't really care that much. Yeah. It's and, just... and it's not like they don't care. It's just that 
it's not that unusual, put it that way. It isn't, it isn't. So after you, you dropped out of school, you went to work. Did you circle back? You just mentioned this. Did you circle back on some more education then? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. I went through and got my GED um, after just working for a while. Uh, I think I was around late 18, my 18th year, I, I had got it and um, ended up, I dabbled in courses. I, I still do. I just, I've never gone for a full out degree. I've always okay. been working sure. full time plus running my comedy troupe. And I sunsetted that in um, early 2020 before it was like demanded that you couldn't have live shows. Right. But I thought, you know, two decades, that's pretty cool to wrap it up. There's a lot of production that goes into it, a lot of administrative. So right now, um, cause our sketch shows were, we write everything and produced three weekends of, in every fall. And that's huge. Plus working full time and raising kids. So it's, yeah. it's amazing. I did it, but I loved it and I don't regret it. And my kids, we're right along with it all. So um, okay. I did, I did finish, you know, I did finish high school and continue with a lot of different interests and courses. Well, I think it's interesting now, you know, the perception and value of, of, of formal education is really different today. Um, mm-hmm. Each kid comes out. I think they're unique in their skills and their interests and those types of things. I have um, one that finished her master's, one that's working on a doctorate, one that, decided school wasn't for him and went off to, and he's in the trades now. I've got another nice. one that went to in a few years for college and then decided that a trade was going to fit his interests better. And then I got we need one. those. We yep, need them. That's right. And then I've got one who thinks she's Taylor Swift. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's all different things, but I think it's really important. Now we, we need everybody in those places. This idea of racking up, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on a college education without any real outcome for, you know, jobs and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just a different world today. And I'm, I like it because I I don't think that there's a one size fits all approach to learning and becoming someone that's better. You know, I think the only time you don't make progress in the world is when you stop learning. I love that. And besides that, how many people do you know with degrees that especially after this last shift or the pause, as I call it, are not using those degrees. How many things, this is to everyone, how many things are you seeing online where the person says, I walked away, I got my master's and I was running a, a six figure company and I walked away and now I, I um, paint with my feet yeah. and I'm happier than I've ever been. Okay, so all those years and you're still paying for that college but you're painting with your feet and you're finally happy, that's awesome. So mm-hmm. it's not all about a degree and it, That's not our family either. We have some in college, we have some in the workforce, but no matter what, all of our five sons are extremely hard workers. And right now what's going on is the people on unemployment will not work because they're making more on unemployment and they're in that age group where they can sit on TikTok and I'm, I'm, or, you know, lay in a hammock all day. Given the choice at that age, hell yeah, I would be doing that. Yeah. But all these places are having to close a few nights a week, at least in my area, the restaurant where one of our sons works closes every other week because they simply don't have staff. Well, what's going to happen in the fall is those people's, the unemployment's going to run out and now you're going to have people scrambling to work. Yeah. It's just, it's a really hard time. So our sons have worked this whole time and covered for those who haven't shown up a no call, no show. And you know what? I, yeah, it's great if you have your master's, And it's great if you can simply not just suck off the system and put on your work clothes and go earn and support business. So tell me a little bit, um, what motivated you to write your first book? It took a long time because I always was fighting that inner uh, negativity voice that was saying, you don't have initials after your name. You should go out, you know, you you shouldn't write. Nobody cares. And finally I had... um, with my husband's support and I found the right editor, huge, huge. And working with her, I started writing stories. And once I unlocked the idea that things don't have to be chronological order, once I unlocked the idea that somebody might wanna read my story, I could just write. And the more I wrote, the more I found and the more memories came back. And because I'm a performer and have done so much on stage in my area, I'm somewhat known. And so I would be in 
a coffee house on my laptop. And I remember the mail carrier, Boyce, Boyce, the mailman, came through and he goes, oh, I loved your last show, this and that. And he goes, what are you working on? And I said, well, I've been putting some stories together. I might do a book. And he said, you remind me so much of Carol Burnett, which is like the highest praise anyone could give me. <laughs> Boy, said, I love you. And then he said, well, tell me when that book is done. I want to buy the uh, copy. I want to buy it. I want your book. And then it would be like a couple of weeks later, we'd see each other again. How's that book coming? Oh, wow. Because he cared. Yeah. I kept going. And isn't that funny? Because you've got my kids are supportive. My husband's supportive. My exes are supportive. We're still friends. I'm easy to divorce. Tell your friends. And all these things. But a stranger said he'd want my book. And by golly, he was at my book signing. And he That's got awesome. a book. I signed it. We hugged. We And he had tears in his eyes. It turned out I was stepping on his foot. No, I'm kidding. He had tears in his eyes. And he said, I came from a similar background and this means a lot. I can't, I can't wait to be a part of, you know, more book launches. So that he didn't tell me he had a similar story. And because of that, people say I'm brave for sharing it and they come to me and I, I certainly say, please therapy, you know, therapy. If you, if you have a story to, to get out, therapy is the best way to make sure you're on the right way to get the right tools but also sharing with, with like-minded people in a safe zone is so healing just to know you're not alone. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just trying to go forward and not repeat it. Exactly. So I, I saw, I think you would laugh at this one. I saw the other day, someone who described themselves as the participation trophy wife. And I thought, that's an interesting moniker, right? So, uh, yeah, yes. the reason why I'm worth having in your life is because I'm, uh, you know, participation. So that's funny. That's funny. Better than arm candy. Good. Yeah, that's right. Better than arm candy uh, and stuff. So specifically, what is your, your, your first, first book about? Is it a biography? Is it, um, you know, tell me what, what it is. So Laps on Rye is, is W-R-Y. Okay. And it's an improviser's memoir finding humor through childhood abuse, failed marriages, and other hurdles. And the main part is it's a life made of choices, not excuses. Okay. And it's yeah. snippets, and it's not in order. And once I could figure out my pattern of writing, it was just so helpful. Everyone has a book, and I encourage everyone to just write down some ideas. And if you mm -hmm. are driving down the road, and you have a recording app on your phone, or pull over and make that note, because the biggest lie in the world is... I don't need to write it down. I'll remember. That's, That's right. not true. So when you can sit and find that moment, if you're a morning person, maybe you're a night owl, find that time and go through your notes and make a story and don't worry about the order. Right. You know, it, just start writing. And it's amazing that all that comes back to you. So I wrote in what I call snippets and they're like two to three pages. And at the end of each one, I share a lesson and I'm not teaching you. I'm saying the lesson I learned. And it's okay. funny that it resonates with others. I, I, I love the feedback I get. I appreciate the reviews people have dropped on Amazon because again, like your show and my podcast, that's how our shows are seen. Mm -hmm. So in the middle are pictures because I have a project in bravery that started as a dare to myself. Okay. And what I do is serious selfies with strangers. And one of them is a lady I saw at a farmer's market and she had this fabulous hat and I oh, asked her for cool. a serious selfie and then I write the story about it from that's serious great. selfies I have ended up making actual friendships and there was the table of ladies next to me in a restaurant and they were having fun so we did a serious selfie and one of them has become a dear friend and we go we go back to that restaurant on the regular and um, we became friends. So because I dared myself to cross the street and ask this, these two girls eating ice cream if we could get a selfie together. And sure. one says, are you an influencer? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'll have to look that up. I don't even know, but can we get a selfie? And so I'm, you know, they're living their best life. We got ice cream. We're young. The sun is out. Right. Hold up my camera. And it occurred to me, let's not smile. <coughs> And that was a heck of a thing because what happens when you say don't smile is you laugh. That's and right. so the, the, 
the whole thing around it is laughter before and afterward when we look at this ridiculous picture of being serious. And then the picture comes out and I hashtag serious selfie with strangers. And it became a thing on my Facebook page. So I, I invite everyone to try that with their friends or their family and, and post it. It's ridiculous fun. Now, is your book on Amazon, you said? It's on Amazon. And okay. otherwise, if you want a signed copy, just reach out to me through Messenger. And okay. there is an audio version as well. Okay, fantastic. Throw out a website or social media so people can connect with you. We have a lot of people who do the play along. So they'll uh, be listening and also sure. looking stuff online. So throw that out for us if you could. Yes, Lisa David Olson, O L S O N dot com. Lisa David Olson on Facebook. I'm on the IG and LinkedIn. Okay. So everything's Lisa David Olson. I stole my husband's middle name because if I put out a book as Lisa Olson, I'm pretty sure there'd be more than one. <laughs> yeah, I would guess that just might happen. Just might yes. Happen. So, so curiosity perspective, how old were you when you wrote your first book? It was uh, 2018. So very late in life or late-ish in life. And then I I'd also did, um, then in 2019, I, I produced my creativity book called What Ifs and Why Nots, and it's creative tips to help reignite stale ideas. So what I use now is my stage experience, my speaking experience, I'm still a speaker, but I use that toward my speaker training that I do and corporate training. And I use creative ideas to help you switch your perspective and just change your ideas and bring in new ideas and fresh ideas, but also how do we reconnect teams now that we've all been remote? I wasn't, but many, many people were remote for so long. How do we get people back together? How do we shift to maybe we're partially remote as we join our businesses back up now? So all those things are in my creativity um, journal. And that you can get through me because I wanted to print locally and it's spiral bound because I'm just... I'm just so thrilled when you can lay a book open and work in it. <laughs> right. A little controlling. As improv as I am, I am still controlling. So uh, tell me, now, you you have a follow-on book that you did, right? I'm sorry? You have a follow-on book that you did, right? You mean the, the yeah, the journal I just talked about, probably. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. Lots of tips on on each page and quotes, and a lot of them are just from me, but if I am... If it's somebody else's idea, I give them the credit for the quote. Okay. And, you know, ideas like dare yourself to do the things. What is it you're thinking about? Is it jumping out of an airplane? That's my next on the list. Okay. And is it trying pineapple on pizza? Do the thing. <laughs> what about like that show Chopped where they, they give you four items in a basket and you have 30 minutes to make an entree? Why not do that game? Why not play? Be creative with food. Be creative with art try something like that. Listen to country. If you only listen to rock, then how does that change your thinking? Sure. I could go on, but I won't. Oh, you're doing well. So uh, tell me a little bit about how'd you get your comedy uh, out on uh, iTunes. Tell me a little bit about your comedy that you've published. OMG. It's so silly. So my first hubby and I, hi, Randy. We used to have an old answering machine with a cassette tape. Kids, a cassette tape is a tape that you have to use a pencil eraser to tighten it up. Anyway, we had this old machine and it would record incoming and outgoing calls if, if you wanted to record them. Nowadays, it's not like that. If, if you look at movies nowadays, it's funny because older movies, part of the plot would be that the answering machine would go off when the detective was there and there would be the criminal saying, okay, right. Nancy, I'm coming over at five. Yeah. But um, anyways, <clears throat> back then we had those kinds of machines. And we also had telemarketers call that were um, actually human. Yes. <laughs> and my husband and I worked separate shifts and it became a game that we would take the telemarketer on a path other than their sales. Sure. And it was great. If I came home from work and that light was flashing, I was thrilled because that means Randy had one. And I, I did a lot more than him because I was home during the day. But one of them is titled M, <clears throat> excuse me a second, <clears throat> M-I-A and N-R-A. And it'll make sense in a second. It's like a two minute clip I can play. You can tell by this guy that he's in cubby land and he's repeating everything I say to the guy next to him. 
So give sure. me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Okay. Hello? Hello? Now, Scott, on behalf of uh, NRA, is B. Thompson there? No, I haven't seen him for like two days. You haven't seen him for two days? No, he said, I can go get the spaghetti sauce and then... He's what? He said... He's out? He said, no, I'm trying to tell you. He goes, I, I can get the spaghetti sauce. I'll be right back, you know, and... It's been two days. He's been, he did what now? What was that again? He went out to get the spaghetti sauce. He went out to get spaghetti sauce and he hasn't come home for two days? I, right. Wow. Do you know where he's at? No, I don't. I'm calling on behalf of the NRA. I don't know where he's at. The NRA, is he in trouble? No, no, no. He's, he's not, in trouble? No, he's not in trouble, ma'am. Are you an officer? <laughs> no, I'm not an officer. Okay. And, uh... I'm not an officer. No, I'm, this is a call for membership in the National Rifle Association. Membership? He doesn't remember anything, especially where he lives. He's been gone two days. <laughs> okay, well. No. I, I'm sorry. I, I can let you go, okay, ma'am? If you see him, would you have him call me? Yeah, I, okay. If I see him, I'll have him call you. Okay, okay that's a good idea. Right, bye now. Thanks. Oh, that, that's hilarious. That's so hilarious. I get him to tell me he's going to have my husband call me. <laughs> uh, <that's funny. laughs> so why you not know. have fun when it's an actual real person? But I think nowadays it's all robots. Well, you know, it's funny now. You get those different calls. Uh, I especially get these ones. Uh, they're from India, you know, that, so they're, their uh, accent is just very, very thick. And they're, you know, they're claiming they're from the IRS or something like that. And I'll do mm -hmm. the same thing. I'll mess with them. And my kids are like, why are you wasting your time? It's like, well, you know, this guy, he's got this horrible job. And all he does all day is call people and try to, you know, steal money from them. So why not waste some of his time? And so I'll, you know, I'll go on and on and on. And then when they, and I'll string along. And then when they get to uh, the part where they're asking for your social security number or credit card or whatever, then I'll abruptly tell them where they can put it. But, um, yep. but no, I love to mess with those guys. I just, just love it. And the, the auto warranty stuff, you know, and I'm like, well, I've got a scooter. Does that count? And you know, stuff yes. like that. So yeah. They're like, what kind of car do you have? I said, I have a Ford Chevy. And they're like, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about those are, if you have elders in your life, please let them know to never share that information. Yeah. As corny as this sounds, I work in a police department by day. I'm in records and I'm local dispatch. We handle so many of these calls where the elders think, one, I can give you that phone number and you're going to catch that guy. <clears throat> yeah. No, you're not. It's, it went through a computer and it looks like it's local. When our elders had a phone uh, back when they were our age, people called because it was real. Yeah. And so they still have it. And that they, they are the target. If they have a landline and they're 70 and up, they yep. are the target. And we had one guy come in that the, they, he got the grandkids scheme. Your grandson is in jail and we're going to need bail money here. Let you can talk to him, grandpa. And he's like, you don't sound like, like Billy. No, but I was in a car accident and my mouth got hurt. And they believe this. They're panicking. Uh -huh. So if they're trying to get you to react, just say, call me back at the police department because I don't believe you. They'll hang up on you. Yeah. But I can't get it out to all the elders because they can't, they don't see it on Facebook. So I always right. say, tell your friends. Did you give any information? No. Okay. You did great. You get ice cream for supper. Tell your yep. friends. And one guy believed it. And this, this scheme was very elaborate where they had him send 9,000 cash Ooh. to Western Union Ooh. to an address in Washington. He did that, and then he came to the PD, and then he called his grandson, who was working three blocks from our police department. The Western Union thing is that the scammers had um, the mark on a vacant house. Mm. They knew that that was going to be delivered at 4.06 p.m. on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Wow, man. That's yeah. like... I, I've seen some of uh, those shows on TV where they're you know, catching scammers like that. And they've got a mark that's hanging out at a vacant house or yeah. you know, place. And then the person just answers the door and walks away with the box. And yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's and that's something. Crazy. So yeah, that's, that is the thing. And so back in the day, that's, that's my album. It's on iTunes. It's called fun on the phone and it's spelled P H U N on the phone. Fun on the phone. That's great. All right. So I want to hopscotch around a little bit. How'd you get your TEDx gig? I, I'm always interested in that. I've watched 
more TEDx uh, speak uh, speeches than I ever care to admit. Um, but how'd you get, get to that process? Yeah, I recommend anybody that has an idea worth spreading, mm -hmm. look up the idea on a TEDx, see what's already out there and find out what makes you unique in your message that is worth spreading. A friend of mine, so I signed up for a masterclass and there is a great masterclass out there and there's another one starting soon. So if you're ever interested, I would definitely connect you to a guy named Cesar Cervantes and he's on Facebook. So I signed up for a, a masterclass, but even before it started, a friend of mine sent me a link to an audition. I'm in Minnesota and it was in Indiana, in Bloomington. And so it's funny, both things happened simultaneously. So I did this audition, everything was going to be Zoom. And this was in April, but I mean, it was like February that it auditions. Anyways, it was right. all going to be produced via Zoom in April. As we all did our three minute pitch live as a group, then we waited and heard back and I got in and I'm still so thrilled that this experience happened. Then we met weekly for two months training and actually there was eight of us. And after like, say Rex, you're going to give us yours. And I might say, that's interesting, but I wonder if you try this. So it turned out that the speakers coached each other, even though not everybody was speakers. And it was great to have eight sure. perspectives. Plus we had a, a trainer on there. And then one of the speakers said, is there any way we can do this in person? So talk about creative thinking and going outside of all the realms of what we were working on. And we did it. We raised money selling tickets to stream it live. And they said, if you can sell 25 tickets, we'll be able to afford the theater. We can only have 50 people in there. And that's including the crew that's going to videotape, do the audio, the lights, all that. Sure. If you can sell streamed tickets, 25 each, we can afford to do this. And I sold 60 because I've been producing shows for so long. Sure. I pulled out all the stops and I sold these tickets at $15 each. So thank you to all my friends and family and fans. And we did, we met up in Bloomington, Indiana, and my husband offered to be the photographer and he took over 3000 photos that oh, are wow. beautiful. And there was another photographer on site. The two of them did such great work. Mm -hmm. It won't be produced. It won't be out until late summer because, again, it's it was all volunteer driven. <clears throat> but I'm excited. That experience happened. Um, I just drove three hours each way to do a 10 minute interview for one that's coming out in November. I'm waiting to hear back. So good vibes. Welcome. Yeah. So what was the topic of your TED talk? My TED talk was seeking humor, discovering bravery. Okay. I talk about coming from a traumatic home, as we've touched on here. I shared my serious selfies with strangers. That's the only thing I used for my PowerPoint was to show some pictures. Mm -hmm. I have an action at the end. I invite people to do and some reminders. And I did it all in nine minutes. Wow. That's fantastic. Shorter times are better right now because of all the screen time, I think. And part of the training, they stated you have 18, but people do not want to sit at a screen and look at charts and graphs. Yeah. In your talk, you also have to have some research-based material. <clears throat> okay, interesting. Well, I've, I've always had that as a, hey, I'd like to try that. I wouldn't call it a bucket list item. Um, you know, I've done a ton of speaking. It's actually a to-do because you're yeah, going to do a, it. It's a to-do. Yes, it is. It is. So what's next on the horizon for you? Well, waiting to hear back from that one. I'm also, I've got clients right now. One person's writing a book. Another one is working on um, getting her speaking career off the ground. I have several ideas that are affordable, that are doable, that um, can get you out there and get you speaking. So I love working with clients. Mm -hmm. I have a nonfiction book in my head and uh, I would love to get that out there because I, I visit with this character a lot in, in conversation and, and right. things that happen during the day. So that's the things I'm working on now. Um, right now, improv gigs are picking up. I just booked two Christmas parties. Oh, nice. So yeah, I'm, my December is starting to fill. December is so, starting to fill up. Yeah. So uh, when you're looking around at your next uh, thing, is it mostly uh, items to fill a, a dream or a void? Or is it just, like you said, task items? For myself, speaking is my passion, and okay. I'm excited that in I I've certainly had some paying speaking gigs over Zoom, but I'm an interactive speaker. I right. use my improv throughout my talk, and my promise is that I won't scare your introverts. 
Sure. And so that is always, that's as good of a tag as saying I'm a professional nag because when I work with clients, I give the gentle reminders or I send articles and I'm helping you. It's not just that one hour meetup. I'm there with you. And so um, for me, getting back out into speaking and connecting with people and sharing humor and connecting through humor and inviting the creative thoughts and that you don't have to keep doing things the same way as we all have just learned in this past year. I just can't wait to celebrate it. I'm passionate about it. And I just love to connect and storytelling is huge. So I love to help people craft their story and share some stories. I love sharing my pranks and encouraging and people like to tell me the pranks they've done. I work with cops and I'm still a prankster (laughs) that it doesn't go very well because they don't react, but I won't give up. I'm just that annoying flea that just keeps like they they don't physically swat but it's the the look the side eye like really yeah. really you're going to try and jump out at me you you realize <laughs> yeah but then they do it to me and all I do is laugh because oh you got me i i, I might have piddled i might have <laughs> that's high praise yeah no kidding so uh when now you're um you teach speaking now do you deliver that in a one-on-one basis? Do you do that in a group setting? How, tell me how you're, what's the modality of you delivering your um, speaking coaching? Yes, right now it's been one-on-one meetups and okay. I'm definitely open to doing a workshop. I haven't thought of doing an online, but that's not out of the question. I just, I fear that people are really tired of the screen. And I think um, meeting in group settings safely is is starting to happen again. Mm -hmm. So right now I've been doing one-on-one, but I, I've also been the presenter to different workshops and I can do it either way. Do you have capacity uh, now to take on more clients? I do. Yes. Because I, I sound busy and, and a friend just recently said, I know you're busy, but that's annoying to me. So I I corrected her. Hey, don't project on me. I have many, many interests, but I also know that multitasking is a lie. Multitasking means I'm going to do two or more things at the same time poorly. Poorly, correct. <laughs> so if I'm with Rex right now, I'm with Rex right now. Right. And, and after this, I have my own podcast. Everything yeah. is in sections, just like you put things in the refrigerator, the butter goes here, the apples go here. That is my life. My life is a refrigerator is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Now, you just hit a perfect segue for me. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Oh, thank you. Stranger Connections with Lisa David Olson. I want the wonderfully weird people. I want the quirky stories and the crazy careers. I talked to a monk who quit monking and I wanted to know all about that. I've talked to an adult male who grew up in Russia and put himself up for adoption at the age of nine. I wanted that story. Yeah. I've talked to um, people who uh, one lady was born without the sense of smell. I think yep. it's Nazmi, Nazmia. Oh, she was a, a hoot. Yep. Every she, guest. Is, yeah, she's out of Boulder, right? Um, yeah, Dia Klein. Yeah. Dia yeah. Klein. Yeah. Dia Klein. Yeah, I, I interviewed Dia. Yeah, she's great. Dia is a riot. If you ever saw Gilda Radner, oh my gosh. Dia, yep. yeah, Dia has no filter. There's a oh. warning. And, and I adore her. So that's another person who became a friend. Yeah. And um, I've talked to people who can do Reiki through Zoom. And uh, one lady interviewed my dog and told me about her backstory without ever knowing anything about my rescue dog. And so many things matched up. That was fabulous. That's Liz Murdoch. She's really, she is talented. Oh, you want to talk to her. She doesn't just talk to dogs. She has a great snake story. You definitely want to hear it. So every one of my guests towards the end shares a dare or prank story that they've either done or had Mm -hmm. done to them. And I have one gentleman who is a very energetic African-American male who grew up in Flint, Michigan. And when I asked him that question, his answer was, oh, girl, you can get killed. You don't do that where I grew up. So I only have one that couldn't totally share. He goes, you don't pull pranks in Flint, Michigan. We get killed. I was like, oh my gosh. So he's amazing. That's <laughs> hilarious. It was. It was funny in the sense that he didn't have one, but otherwise it's mandatory on my show. I have another one I, I'm going to recommend to you. Uh, you you do need to interview Zel, um, Ellie Soja, you know, the lady who moved 63 times. And again, we'll send these off air. 
But there's another one that I interviewed down in Australia, or maybe New Zealand, uh, Marianne Coleman. Now, Marianne is a, is a medium, okay? Uh -huh. but she, she also has star friends. Oh, fun. And she's been on UFOs, apparently. And so... Uh, I think we all have. It's just that she remembers. She remembers, and she's been there multiple <laughs> times. And Neat. The, the sarcastic person of me, I just... I had to run with some of that because it was, it was, she was out there. I mean, and could it you still serve peanuts on a UFO or do they have the right. allergy oh, thing? Yeah, she, yeah, it was interesting. If you want to go for a, a <laughs> ride, get a hold of Marianne Coleman. Um, a great interview. She's really uh, energetic, but uh, neat. Yeah, I walked away from that one going, wow. <laughs> that just happened <laughs> that just happened and i'm gonna and i'm gonna filter some of the other comments i said but uh wow that was it was interesting but so, wow uh, sums it up i bet yeah, yeah. wow the wow was always <laughs> needed to say wow That's the wow factor anyway. well you've been fantastic to uh come on and share your story and i'm glad that you were able to be transparent and vulnerable with this and sharing you know some of your background because you know, that doesn't come out on every time we speak and those types of things and, and present or write a book or those types of things. So um, right. thank you for doing that. I appreciate thank you for your platform, Rex. And it is interesting to see how many things, because we're in the same age realm, that how much aligns. And by sharing our stories, just like you and I did, it shows that it's okay. We support each other. We understand each other. Sharing stories is the important part of being a human and thank you for your platform. I'm definitely going to rate your show. I will share this and I encourage everybody to subscribe and please rate this show so more people can see it. Well, we'll, we'll get you back on. There's a lot more to explore here. So I have one last question for you that I ask all my guests and it uh, kind of a left-handed question. You know, here in the Western cultures, we have this concept called a bucket list, okay? And you mentioned you wanted to spill out of an airplane. Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, he actually interviewed the bucket list guy. His name is Tra Trav Albert. And Ooh. you just go to his website, thebucketlistguy.com. And he, he really talks about, it isn't so much about building a bucket list. He just talks about building a life of purpose, you know, doing purposeful things. Well, anyway, right. the, the concept of a bucket list, are, you know, things we want to do before our time is done. But then there's another angle on this. There's always an opposite of everything that, that exists. So there's a list of things we don't want to do. Okay, or don't want to do again. Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show. So yeah. it's the effort list. Okay, sure. So what might be a couple items on your effort list? Now I'll give you a couple samples for me. Like I'm not going to have a collection of pet snakes. That's just not going to happen. All right. I'm not interested in eating monkey brains again. I'm not interested again? in eating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not interested in eating any more sardines or caviar. And then uh, this is the one, I actually did an episode on this. Uh, I don't remember which one it was, but I did an episode way back on this. I will never ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge. The uh, concept of excessive heat, excep excessive um, uh, humidity, excessive uh, drumming and chanting and a slice of nudity, it's just not worth it. A slice of nudity. That yeah. sounds like a great movie. There's your book title. Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy it. I actually did an episode on that sweat lot. It's, it's called one and done. It's just one and done. <laughs> sweaty and, Rex. Yeah, Hashtag right. sweaty Rex. So what, what might be an, uh, an item that be on your effort list or, or a couple? Mm, uh, my effort list, Rex, is definitely not exploring anything that has to do with being extra cold for long okay. periods of time. So and you, you won't and, find And you live in Minnesota. Yeah, uh, hey, right. okay. you betcha there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that sitting on ice and fishing is a great plan. For one, I've seen cars that go through. I've seen people that fall through. And I'm lucky enough to have a box of granola bars and not be hungry enough to drop a string through a hole in 30 degree below weather when, you know, okay. So you got your friends that have the huts and the, and the TV and the, all that stuff on the ice. I'm like, Really, dude, you must hate your marriage, but yeah. okay. So no, so ice fishing is on my effort list. Um, and I suppose eating glass would be on there Okay. as okay. well. And um, yeah, I, I don't need to give my time to those that are just energy vampires. And okay. that's a, a daily effort. Yeah. Because no when you get to be older, you realize your, your time is, is precious. 
uh, a friend was just diagnosed with something that could be terminal. We don't know yet. And so you kind of shift your perspective. So what are you doing with all these minutes in this one day as you spin on this rock and we don't know what's next? So go out and do the good stuff. I love this idea of the effortless and I'm, I'm going to join you with no monkey brains, but I don't have again, cause that's not something okay. I would do. Well, good <laughs> monkeys need their brains. That's Leave them right. alone. That's Leave right. the monkeys alone. <laughs> well, that's a story in itself. So yeah. anyway, well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate uh, you uh, being so transparent, sharing uh, all sides. It's been great to, to know you. Good luck on your next uh, TEDx uh, speech. Hopefully that comes. Am I going to get it? I hope so. You're going to make it happen. I would so. Thank you. So anyway, I will uh, let our folks know to please stop by your website at lisadavidolson.com. That is it. And then also all your social media. And I'll remind our listeners today to please step out to the rexandrewshow.com to uh, check out the profiles and information there. All of our guests are out there. So I uh, want to thank Lisa for coming on today. And until next time, we will say what we say every single time. Be safe, but be bold and make it a great day.